let's get going. Hello, everybody. Thanks a lot for joining us in person and online for this hybrid uh, SIA public uh, life event in conversation. Today in conversation, the topic is cura uh, curating and memory culture today. We're very fortunate to have three excellent guests joining us today to join me and all of us in conversation on this most excellent, wide ranging and complex topic. They are Maso Cherapenian, Sophie Goltz, and Tanya Roy. Let me just introduce all of them and then Tanya will kick off with an introduction. Lasso is a key based curator, cultural theorist, and political organizer. He is head of the Visual Culture Research Center in Kyiv, a platform for collaboration between communities of art practitioners, scholars, and activists, which also organizes the Kyiv Biennale. So the Goltz is director of the Salzburg Summer Academy of Fine Arts. Previously, she was deputy director research and academic program at NTUCCA Singapore, where I met her before, and assistant professor at the NTU School of Art, Design, and Media. She has served as the artistic director in, in Hamburg as city curator and associate curator of Neuer Berliner Hutzwellen. She has worked as an independent curator and art educator for various international exhibitions, including Documenta 11 and Documenta 12, the third Berlin Biennale for Contemporary Art, and Project Migration in Köln, Frankfurt on Main, and Zurich. The, the third contributor to our conversation today is my old friend, uh, Tanya Roy. She's a senior lecturer in the Department of English, Literature, and Theater Studies at the National University of Singapore, where she is also convener of the MA in Literary Studies. She is also the arts editor of the exemplary journal, Cultural Politics, published by Duke University Press. Thank you all for joining. Thank you, Ryan, <laughs> for that generous introduction and to Sia for inviting us, for the organizers, uh, and uh, to friends, old and new, uh, thanks for being present for this conversation. So I think I will just begin with um, a, a kind of broad comment on the question of uh, Irina Rung's culture, uh, translated as commemorative culture uh, into English, but in the German has a connotation of a kind of interiority, a kind of uh, subjectivity that doesn't quite um, transpose itself as readily into the English. So if we begin with the notion of uh, commemorative culture, Irina Rung's culture, we I suppose for the purposes of today, should remember that the, the phrase really derives from uh, the moment of German reconstruction in the post-war years. And, um, uh, and, and I think that there is an urgency to that question within Germany today, to the extent that it continues to signal, um, I think something like a programmatic uh, national concern mm. um, with uh, identity and public spaces, uh, particularly by linking articulations of national responsibility in the present uh, to the memory of Nazi crimes. Um, and of course, today, the emphasis that I hope we can generate with Sophie and Basil is the manner in which Irina uh, Rung's culture in, a, in as this kind of programmatic concern within public spaces, uh, of course, is linked intimately to questions of the arts, to design um, and to museum practices. Um, but I also want to sig uh, uh, sort of signal or, or kind of point to the way in which the idea of memory culture has also become quite portable today. And it has traveled quite widely, I think, from that, that context uh, into what we might loosely want to think about as decolonial practices and concerns that um, today, you know, for many of us, um, is a kind of urgent um, inflection of um, public space, culture, and memory in us while uh, decolonizing societies, right? So that the connection between public me memory, uh, archives, uh, museum spaces, public monuments, um, city environments, and their relationship, of course, to imperial geographies, uh, histories of extractivism, accumulation, right, that constitute uh, aspects of urban material, metropolitan culture 
uh, both in erstwhile empires and also in post-colonial societies. So I, I would just um, say that those are the sort of two vectors within which we can begin to start thinking about um, this question of public life, curation, uh, and memory culture. And with that, perhaps uh, the, uh, Basil and uh, Sophie can introduce their interests. And maybe we begin with Sophie, and then Basil will come back to you. OK, thank you, Tanya, for the introduction. Welcome, Marcel. Um, I would like, to, obviously, as the German-speaking subject here in the room, I would like to make a few remarks to this introduction, which I think are quite important, maybe, to understand the tensions within this term Erinnerungskultur, and they are not often said. One thing is, it is not a German, it's a German-German Erinnerungskultur, which kind of adds already another complexity that is barely discussed. Second, um, Erinnerungskultur is a term that became very strong in the 1990s. Why so? It is, one has to understand, the division of Germany in East and West. Um, both states were not sovereign. So something that was actually what we call, today call a Deutsche Erinnerungskultur was not possible by then, simply because none of the states were governed by itself. The East was governed by the Soviets and the West by the alliances. So, and of course, the, unif the new and unified Germany kind of brought up, in a way, this question of how to commemorate and how to basically present this new German state within Europe, but also within the world. Um, yeah, and that's sad. So I would like that what, uh, with the quote, it actually sums up a little bit what might, how we might enter the discussions of Erinnerungskultur today. And it's a quote from Max Strelick uh, from 2023, and it's a summary, so I, I read. Whose history is remembered and in what way also determines who belongs to society in this country, so Germany? Therefore, a crucial question in the coming years will be how memory culture as a part of plural society can be thought of in such a way that it is also that it is it also includes those parts that do not want to or cannot be part of the spectacle of reconciliation. So in German he calls it Versöhnungstheater. In this context, it is already becoming increasingly clear that a pluralistic culture of remembrance not only means taking in more stories, but also adapting a different relationship to history. Uh, on the way to a pluralistic culture of remembrance, it will be therefore be necessary to distance oneself from an approach that presupposes reconciliation at the result of remembrance work. And I think this is a very important point. And ultimately, it will be a matter of no longer understanding history as a place of positive identification, but as a reminder of how big bad things can get. So I leave this. Yeah, maybe I said you want to add something before we maybe go into some practices. Or maybe one more quote, because I think it also brings up a bit more global perspective. We all have seen, uh, especially uh, during the pandemic and the Black Lives Matter movement, when, when there was the slogan, Monuments Must Fall. And that's a quote by uh, Paul Presadio. Uh, we collectively inhabit an iconic landscape that is saturated with the signs of power endorsed by historical and epic narratives and aestheticized and naturalized to the extent that we are no longer able to perceive their cognitive violence. And I think this is a term uh, that I guess we follow in our discussions, how we actually handle this cognitive violence. Marlon, uh, sorry, Vasil, would you like to uh, to come in and say a little bit about yourself in relation to the topic? Pick up on where some right, here. right, yeah. I hope you you hear and uh, see me well. Uh, yeah, thanks so much again uh, to uh, you, Tanya, uh, to Ryan, and to Sophie uh, for being part of this uh, really um, pretty crucial, I would say, topicality, especially from the Ukrainian perspective. So uh, just to start off, uh, I would like to uh, to share with you a few points uh, 
also from a political person as well as institutional perspective of uh, mine like also take into account uh, kind of my institutional uh, biography uh, that uh, as it was kindly mentioned that uh, I'm running the uh, cultural center which is also the uh, key biennial organizer so first of all I have to say that um, maybe it may sound in a kind of an old-fashioned Althusserian way but uh, what is usually called uh, uh, like in German, Erinnerungskultur or, or commemorative or remembrance culture. I think a culture here is basically used as a term, uh, a, a kind of a, as a substitute for uh, ideology. So I would rather insist that uh, not just to diminish the, the, the practice itself in the city space also, but rather to point out at the uh, political function of this uh, approach as such from its very inception, I would say. So uh, for that matter, of course, uh, different contexts have uh, various types of uh, commemorative approaches, but I would say that uh, we in Ukraine, uh, because I mean, what Sophie outlined, and uh, this is really very crucial, I think, uh, because it also um, kind of indicates the, the uh, political local route of what is called Erinnerung or, or commemoration, right? So it has uh, so it has a specific European or even pan-European meaning exactly because it it has been taking place after the Holocaust, right? So without that atrocity, it would totally mean nothing. It would be simply it wouldn't exist actually, right? So uh, at the same time, uh, I would say that um, currently in Ukraine. Uh, it's really a very kind of a tricky period because we are going through the war atrocities which will unavoidably require proper commemoration, right? So, uh, so we are in, in, in this kind of a double bind at the moment that we have to survive and to repel the uh, Russian aggressors at the same time thinking while the atrocity is still ongoing without any, actually any end uh, in sight, how, to, how it should be commemorated in principle, right? So this is one peculiarity, I would say, uh, to our situation. At the same time, uh, institutionally speaking, uh, uh, from the, uh, yeah, from the Kyiv Visual Culture Research Center or Kyiv Biennial perspective, we have been always working and curating the public space, the, the city space, um, with, with some references to commemoration. But I would say that this was um, basically what was much more interested for, for, uh, for us as a collective, uh, as an, an institution, was basically what, um, what may, uh, in a way, kind of overlap with this um, global wave of uh, uprisings and uh, on and uh, revolutions which uh, in general might be called uh, square occupation movements right so uh, i mean not not just specifically one uh, one uh, one period of uh, like let's say 2011 2014 right uh, i mean from tahrir to maidan but in general as an institution wherever we, we have been based uh, throughout all these years since 2008 uh, when we were established. Uh, so we have been always somehow related to and working on in, in the public city space, but predominantly with some squares. And I think, um, uh, so it, 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 too, it, it was, yeah, in, in very different uh, forms like protecting uh, public space from devastation or from commercialization or to, uh, to pro pro or proposing a different educational use for the public space. Uh, so uh, it was very much also it was very much based on, on the history and on, on our university background. But at the same time, I think one of the important um, features, especially when we talk within the framework of this commemoration is that this is not about the past, but this is rather something which has to be used and really useful for, a, for an actual political purpose. I think th this, this, this characteristics 
bring something which is missing in this kind of a veneration of of the past which is a bit kind of hollowed up and uh, and pretty often when especially when it, when this tendency is coming from the state side is just uh, basically to uh, to to say that uh, we are done with some problem that we tick the box and it's over right so i think quite the opposite especially with regards to remembrance that it, it is not something that uh, is uh, simply is over but uh, th that uh, it has a really an actual purpose and can be uh, can be experienced and practiced in a in a explicitly political manner. That was also one of the our institutional approaches that uh, that uh, we have been always having. And third uh, point, just to wrap it up here, uh, and perhaps trigger the discussion further. Uh, also, especially from the Kiev biennial point of view, we also uh, have to take into account that. Uh, yeah, unlike the German speaking context or uh, or in general, like West European one, right? This uh, specificity of the post-Soviet European East, um, uh, especially when we refer to the post-Second World War period and the Cold War era, uh, it, it has been always very much about some type of um, what perhaps might be called alternative modernity. And uh, with regards to the city space, uh, one of the one of the focuses that we have been always having, and uh, it was actually institutionalized in the sense that we have been always working with this type of architectural uh, city heritage, was the 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 emphasis on uh, the so-called socialist modernism architecture, right? And uh, this uh, uh, because this type of the architectural and historical legacy uh, has been put in a big uh, under a big question obviously due to like what we a bit discussed uh, yesterday uh, about the decommunization so called campaign which started after the basically after the fall of the uh, berlin wall and the crash of the soviet union so uh, so this uh, kind of an alternative uh, architectural trend which arrived in the east of Europe only after the Second World War, simply because in the late 20s and the 30s, these avant-garde modernist uh, um, art tendencies uh, were uh, just uh, erased uh, also physically, right, uh, uh, in, in the east of Europe. So this uh, trend arrived uh, in this uh, uh, in the second world, what used to be called, and even in the third world, pretty late, like uh, in the late 50s, the 60s, the 70s. And at the same time, um, after the crash of the Soviet Union, it also became part of an um, anti-imperial struggle against the Moscow metropolis, right? But at the same time, it contained a lot of uh, emancipative potential. Uh, but uh, according to the state point of view and uh, in the public common sense, uh, it was kind of a disregarded as a proper architectural and political legacy. So for that matter, we have been always kind of very much focused and working with, with uh, this type of architecture and these places, which uh, for that matter uh, had been never uh, used for artistic and cultural purposes before. But for us, it, it, it has been always kind of one of the most important uh, points also to characterize and to strengthen some uh, local uh, as well as international identities for that matter. So I put comma here and uh, I hope uh, that we discuss it further. Yeah, go on. Yeah. Actually, yeah, I would like to add, so, I mean, I would like to, to mark a difference here. I think this is what I meant when we say like the German German, right? Mm -hmm. So what you actually call, uh, na uh, pointed out, it's called Entschuldung. And it's maybe something like Entkunstung, you cannot translate. But basically, it means to kind of put your guilt away. And a lot of the Erinnerungskultur has to do with this kind of Entschuldungs complex. So, and I think we mentioned yesterday, it is also to point to others and not to yourself, mm -hmm. which is actually your problem and not that of the other person. So, but I do see a difference is what you see is how 
um, and I have an example which I cannot show here, it's a bit pity, but is how memorial, I mean, how memorial sites were overwritten through the process of unification. And that's something that is, gives a little bit of a, for those who know Berlin and who know the Neue Wache, what you, uh, and there is this huge figure of Kete Kollwitz, Kieta, which basically commemorates her son from World, uh, who died in World War One, which was a very small sculpture um, and it's been blown up like 10 times now. They are kind of commemorating any kind of victims of totalitarianism. But by 89, the Neue Wache was a memorial for against fascism, so to speak. So, and that has been changed into new narratives of what we now call Deutsche Erinnerungskultur. So, but I think there is something that a lot of things have been taken away before even being discussed of this, what you call this alternative modernity, which in a way through the transformation process basically disappeared. There, so it, this was not the process, this was a top-down process of not basically appropriating history, rather take it away. Yeah. And to what extent, Sophie, would that be related to this uh, very interesting kind of historical specificity, which is also becomes very easily elided in conversations as well when you talk about a German Erinnerungs culture, which has to do with this um, historical peculiarity where effectively we use the term backwards, right? That there's that you don't actually have a sovereign nation state, uh, a unified sovereign national entity um, until the 90s, right? So, so I wonder if you could just unpack that, uh, that process of erasure, as you're saying, uh, and with it, uh, certain kinds of um, specificities from the constitution of commemorative culture with regard to German unif reunification, because I think that would also bring us back to Basil's uh, very interesting idea of also there again a different yeah. temporality where um, where you know formations come, architectural formations arrive belatedly in a delayed way uh, through a very different perspective uh, in the Cold War years. So yeah. Maybe just, I would like to put a kind of positive connotation to it first, because I do, I mean, we're now speaking of the critique and what we do not see there anymore, it, it was also an achievement. It was something when we look back to the 68, really forced this kind of confrontation between generations mm -hmm. to understand actually what's happened and that your parents, your grandparents have been involved in the Nazi regime and how to speak about it. Mm -hmm. And it, it took generations to actually established this as yeah. a kind of discourse within society. So I can't see it only negatively, even though there is a lot of critique, but there is something that is also an achievement. Because if now they being based in Austria, I can tell you it's not there. <laughs> so and that's so yeah, we we know we, we always know the critique, but we also have to see it took generations. So for example, one of the examples I want to show is that it was actually in 89 in Hamburg when they had an open call for an, a, a monument against fascism, which was very uncommon in the time even to think about like that. And it's one of the key kind of examples until today. And uh, uh, Young wrote, uh, James Young wrote a lot about it. It's a monument that disappears. And in itself, it questioned already its own monumentality that can't be there if you're against something. So in this kind of negative form, so it kind of is a column seven meters high, Esther of Gerz and Jochen Gerz, and every year it kind of was disappearing for one year. And after seven years, it kind of disappeared completely. And today you have like something marked on the floor. So, and um, yeah, I lost what I was going to say else, but anyway, maybe Marcel wanna. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely the, the, the achievement and uh, I think it was really it has it had such a profound um, reverberation that basically all the other commemorative uh, strategies that uh, emerged afterwards were sort of destined in a way to follow the the footprints of uh, uh, of what uh, was done in uh, in Germany in particular, but at the same time I think. Um, so yeah, obviously it's very uh, it's very hard to compare uh, our context, right? Because uh, 
Ukraine uh, back in the day was occupied by uh, the Nazi Germany. Uh, and uh, so it's just different positions, uh, uh, the same as, as now with the, the Russian so-called Federation. But I, I, I'm just... Um, I'm just thinking about that from uh, from yeah two angles. First of all, uh, like um, that we, we have to constantly keep in mind that any type of um, commemoration strategy which is claiming its goals is also very much about erasure, right? I mean, it's also very much about this remembering or decommemorating and. Uh, so uh, I, for that matter, I'm also yeah very interested, and that's what we have been trying to highlight within our institutional framework throughout these years. Uh, what, what is uh, decommemorated in commemoration, right? <laughs> I think uh, that this is something more more telling what what this commemoration doesn't commemorate, right? And uh, but of course, I mean. Uh, like uh, on in in the public sphere and uh, from especially from the state side, what uh, what has been done in Germany in that respect uh, is really uh, uh, yeah genuinely amazing. And um, on the other hand, uh, I think that um, th this kind of erasure is also very different. Uh, for those uh, who used to be perpetrators and uh, for those who, who used to be the victims or are victims like, uh, like Ukrainians are uh, at the moment. And uh, this complicates, uh, because for, in some sense, I would say that for the perpetrators, uh, it's even easier, right? Just because, um, mm, it's just what, what what Walter Benjamin used to call Einbahnstrasse. Just it's a one-way ticket. You 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 know what should be done, right? Because you know, I mean, if you of course are conscious about that, right? Uh, we can only dream uh, about uh, such uh, Russia in the in uh, in some future, uh, yeah, like like what happened to to Germany. But for 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 the victims, it's um, more complicated because especially on the occupation, right? especially on, on the occupation, historically speaking, as well as with regards to the current ongoing war. Just because, uh, because um, there is a danger to be, um, to, to easily become part of um, victimization discourse or victimization ideology, right? Which, um, which has so many traps, I have to say. And we actually have been also experiencing this in Ukraine in the last years, especially after 2014, after the, when, when, when the war and occupation started, when uh, any type of the past, which in that or another manner was also interconnected or part uh, with uh, or somehow connected yeah with the the, the russian uh, federation or the soviet union or the russian empire it, it has been a kind of a constant attempt to uh, to erase it all as if we have been always only victims and never subjects right and this is the problem so it doesn't mean that we were not victims as such yeah we, we definitely were but the problem is that it historically, this, this kind of a trap of, com it's a really a trap of commemoration, which is much more on the victim side than on the perpetrator's side, which unfortunately deprives the victims of their own agency or uh, historical subjectivity in retrospect, right? At the same time, which uh, if, we, if we really uh, yeah, think historically, it is not true. But the problem is that when you are, uh, yeah, when, when you are constantly victimized, there is this kind of um, double trap that you have to avoid. So, so for that matter, I was also mentioning this, uh, for instance, uh, socialist modernism, right, or other, other, or, or, or the Ukrainian culture of the 1920s, for instance, which, uh, which was, uh, yeah, kind of, it was officially called the Red Renaissance, right. So. So uh, there were exact historical examples and time periods which uh, which can be easily just 
outsourced and sold out to the aggressor. And pretty often this is kind of, um, especially in the wartime, it has this effect that you are, uh, how, how is it called? That you are shooting in your knee, right? Uh, in your own knee. Also, but uh, if I might, the, if I yeah, yeah. In, in some sense, I think that there's, there's a point of exchange here, which might have to do with that kind of, uh, the, the pressure of the nation in some way, right? That that in some sense sets the parameters for a program market uh, sense of commemor or a culture of commemoration, but also in this way, in the way that you're quite eloquently pointing out, uh, is is it to technology also for for these kind of erasures, right? That that in some sense that that belated imposition of 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 a national formation as either sovereign or as victim. Is, is itself a kind of process of decommemoration in some way that 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 I think I'm, I would just point it out from the way in which you're uh, responding to Sophie. The other thing I'll just say here is that um, it seems to me like one one common sense response to this uh, problem, and I think in the vein of uh, Sophie's uh, uh, pos kind of sober uh, but positive comment, I think one has to also consider the way in which pluralism in many polities is a response uh, to processes of historical erasure and the loss of memory. So I would just like to hear a little bit about this from both of you. I mean, what, why, why is it that, um, or let, let me just put it up, out as an idea that, that what, what would you, how would you respond to the model of a kind of uh, pl pluralism uh, within public spaces uh, which um, actually positively instantiates or specifies minor histories, which are also part of a kind of claim to um, social justice, uh, cultural representation, right? That that could be one model. Uh, so I wonder how, I know Sophie began with a comment on uh, that kind of circle this question of pluralism and history, but perhaps uh, both of you could comment on this, especially from the, the possibilities, but also erasures that uh, come with the imposition of a kind of national paradigm, and right, in public culture. Okay. Um, I start, Monsieur, it's okay. Yeah, 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 definitely, yeah. Uh, maybe just one uh, footnote to what you said about this kind of double victimization. So what you one could see in the memorial discourse in the, let's say, after the change of the millennium is that especially in Holocaust memorials, this double victimization was taken out by actually telling the stories of a killed person, not telling the numbers, but telling the personal stories of the loss actually that happened. So I think there was a shift in the way also how photographs were reframed within these kind of memorial sites, etc. So I think there is something that within the discourse around these sites changed. For example, another example, I think I'm the person who gives examples, but <laughs> is uh, that um, in these kind of former prisons of the Stasi, which was the kind of security service of the GDR, uh, is actually people who have been in jail, they are now giving guided tours, and that's a kind of reappropriation <laughs> of their history. So telling their own history in the place, basically, of torture and trauma. So, and I think that there is, there's an awareness, I would say, maybe less in on the political side, but on the cultural side of those people who operate these places, and uh, to find ways um, to, I mean, to give it a certain kind of, to put it into pro progress, let's put it this way. And now to your question, I, I want to bring up another ex example from <laughs> Hamburg. Well, I think it's, I can't show the picture because it would be funny, but anyway. The largest Bismarck statue is in Hamburg. It is about 47 meters high. It is an it's incredibly imposturing Bismarck with the sword as the kind of German hero. And it was always in discussion. And by the time um, in 23rd, back in 2015, uh, um, what to do it, they had to be renovated. There was, there was a park around it. So there was a kind of participatory project about the park these kind of typical open participatory projects where you give your ideas and never know what's happened to them. So, and there was this Austrian uh, artist group, Steinhuber and Dempf, and they placed everywhere in the city Capricorns on kind of high buildings, the Michel, which is a church tower in the harbor and on top of Bismarck. And we had a discussion with them 
about this project, so maybe a little bit arbitrary of that project, putting Capricorns everywhere uh, in a flat country. Um, so, and of course, what the background was, which we by then brought, wanted to bring in, is the question of this pluralistic view on Bismarck. So, for any person of color, Bismarck is not neutral. And we have been highly criticized for doing that. It was a very emotional debate. So why we would criticize the memorial of Bismarck and to, so given neutrality of it. And it is now 10 years later, uh, and I want to quote something which I think is interesting in the sense of this kind of epistemic violence that I mentioned before. Uh, now it's 10 years later that there is actually an artistic competition about decolonizing this statue. So what I'm trying to say is also in the sense of how we think of this kind of public spaces and what the time is needed to change things. We sometimes forget the component of the time. Yeah, yeah. So and how much time is needed, maybe how much discourse is needed to actually come to that point that 10 years later, like the city itself decided to have a competition with a certain also in discussion with a certain group that kind of tries to so-called de decolonize Hamburg. And but I want to show how maybe a bit about the structural question, and I quote here about what's actually left from that area of Bismarck uh, in Germany. And it's a quote from Natasha Akeli, uh, which is kind of a feminist, uh, anti-racist writer. The racist absurdities did not take away and influence the social reality of black Germans early on, who were born in the most cases as illegitimate children of German parents based on the colonial mixed marriage law. They were not granted residence rights in the German empire because of their supposed ra racial affiliation. At the time, being German was established by law as white, but without explicitly designated it as such. Instead, it was regulated by law that the descendants of Africans then called natives could not be Germans. Residence Pflicht, kind of a residential duty, was also used as a political control measure in colonial governments. It can be found again today in the Asylum Act. According to the section 56 of the Asylum Act, asylum seekers and tolerated persons are only allowed to move within a residence area assigned to them. As a reaction to the racist arson attacks in Hoyerswerda and Rostock-Lichtenhagen at the beginning of the 1990s, this law was tightened by the so-called asylum compromise. The riots at the time, as well as the NSU, active since the end of the 1990s and rooted in Chemnitz and Zwickau, and its far-reaching network prepared the breeding ground for today's racist movements, such as Pegida, the Identitarian Movement, right-wing hooligans, NPD, AfD, and last but not least, concerned citizens. Yeah, Sophie, Vasil, if you respond, then we can also uh, turn the discussion to people who are in the room and online. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, definitely. Uh, just, uh, yeah, a few short points with regards to uh, these technologies of erasure and uh, pluralistic possibilities uh, let's hope if if any um, the the problem how should i put it it's you know the, the problem especially at the moment because uh, i'm i'm when i'm like speaking right now and and thinking about these matters uh, i'm i'm still uh, in a way part of the war right and the problem is that uh, actually um, when when we uh, so, so yeah the biggest challenge a historical challenge uh, uh, at the moment for for ukraine is uh, is basically that um, the prospect the future prospect of uh, the ukrainians um, living on on their land uh, is unclear right so I mean, this is how how it looks like, right? Because uh, we don't, especially like if we if you take into account the the uh, the technological and nuclear disasters that we have been threatened with or that already took place, right? So we we actually don't know 
who will be living there and on which land and how much land we will have at the end of all this, right? So this is really something that uh, is really very even hard to embrace mentally, I would say. So for that matter, when, uh, when, but at the same time, definitely there is a constant talk about a commemoration while the war is still uh, going on. Uh, just I think also because it also serves a very practical kind of a psychopolitical in a way purpose for for the Ukrainian communities and for the Ukrainian people in general, just to have some uh, public uh, physical marks that they can invest their emotions and their frustrations in, right? To refer to uh, to also especially as as uh, as Ukraine, uh, yeah, became actually one one big uh, cemetery over the last year. So th this need is uh, is absolutely clear. But at the same time, uh, I mean that under the under, this, uh, this, under such conditions, it's very hard to speak about different uh, pluralistic or alternative approaches, right? Just because this commemorative um, need is serving uh, the a very practical purpose for the community in a survival mode, right? But at the same time, if we if we reflect on these pluralistic possibilities over the period of the last nine years, right? If, for instance, we take the period after the Maidan revolution and the start of the Russian occupation till uh, the pre-last uh, February, I mean, in last year, right? So I can say that, uh, yeah, from the curatorship standpoint and from the cultural institutional standpoint, I would say that that definitely were. And uh, especially uh, from, uh, yeah, interesting would be that it, it's not by chance in a way that it was exactly the cultural realm, the art field that became an, uh, an alternative to the state discourses throughout the, the, the last nine, nine years. And uh, I think especially important what Sophie uh, emphasized uh, about telling uh, some personal stories or histories, uh, right? That's how the, the so-called double victimization was, was avoided and taken out. Uh, I think this is, this is really uh, very, very important. I would just a bit paraphrase that approach because in Ukraine, what, what uh, art practitioners and cultural workers uh, have been proposing since 2014 was first of all, was an attempt to create a different visuality and different type of discursivity alternative to the media one, right? I think th this is really something that, that Ukrainian cultural practitioners were really very successful at. And uh, this is something also to be, to, to be learned by, by their uh, European, other European counterparts. And secondly, also referring to what Sophie said, I think um, uh, like methodologically speaking, what a cultural realm and, and uh, art as such was has been very much relying on was what maybe a bit pathetically might be called the power of the document, like the document, right? Documentation, document as such as the as the as the ultimate kind of signification and uh, a power that is kind of um, um, yeah with a power of a witness and uh, as and uh, kind of a, the same intimate but also political story that can be uh, directly presented without any uh, sort of curves of uh, the power of representation, right? So I think this documentation, the, the intention towards documentation, documenting everything, like uh, right here and right now, which emerged actually during the revolutionary times uh, themselves and then prevailed in the years afterwards. And by the way, again, not by occasion that after the Maidan revolution, uh, and even and also throughout the last year, we got a boom of U Ukrainian documentaries, right, which are now, uh, yeah, internationally very, very famous. So it's because of this methodology of sticking to the document as a kind of an ultimate method to, uh, to yeah, to tell the story about what has actually happened. I think that that's, that's where Ukrainian type of pluralism was very much rooted in. 
Thank you, Vasa. Uh, and also bringing in the question of time and temporality and its um, very political and striking differences between the two contexts. So perhaps we could have a few minutes also, so I think we might have started yeah, a little bit. Might, um, yeah, we yeah. can maybe go a little bit over. Um, but I, I think you know the point that Basil was making uh, links back to the idea of if if philosophy, if thought has has an imperative, it is an imperative that comes in the hope for a future moment, and that that becomes the site in which a commemorative possibility could could emerge. Um, so I'd like now if, not only to to thank the entire panel, but we, we hold our applause for that. But just to say, great catalyst for Q and A. And if you guys have some cues, both online or in the room, then I'm sure they'll have some A's in response to it. Um, are, are there any questions? Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Hold on. Let me get him a, a microphone. Hello. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, first, a question for Sophie. Um, you talked about Black Germany and you talked about Black Lives Matter. Um, and you sort of referenced how this um, this kind of local event in, in the United States, which was not an extraordinary event, um, moved uh, and was articulated in specific contexts um, in ways that, that, that were fundamentally about memory. So in Britain, of course, there's the uh, throwing the statue of Colston, the slave trader, into the uh, into the the harbour at Bristol. Uh, some extraordinary pictures from Brussels of uh, statues of King Leopold daubed with BLM graffiti. Um, I'd, I'd quite like to know how that played out in public space in Germany, especially given the the sort of quite public resistance to um, notions of entangled histories or multi-directional memory. Um, I'm thinking of the sort of furore around Achille and Bembe, um, what's being referred to as historical strike 2.0. Um, that was my question for Sophie. And, and, and Vassal, I, <laughs> I feel a bit cheeky because I, I really wanted to ask you a question yesterday. Um, and and perhaps perhaps I can ask it to you today as well. I, I, I suppose I'm, I'm interested in the way that, um, well, I'm interested in your thoughts on how Ukrainian-Polish relations the kind of playing into all of this. Um, what has the kind of the invasion and occupation meant in terms of the kind of sometimes antagonistic sort of memory cultures at play between between these two yeah. nations? But thank you um, both. Fantastic, really interesting. Okay, okay. Maybe I, Jagger can ask back. I'm not fully sure because. Uh, one thing is this kind of statelessness for kind of movement, mm -hmm. um, which we also know from Latin America about the Columbus statues. Mm -hmm. right? So I'm not sure. I mean, I think the result around the Bismarck is coming from that, mm -hmm. that there is an open discussion, at least what to do with it mm -hmm. by not erasing it. That's going to be more difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not sure to link it to a larger debate you mentioned, which is the G5.2. Mm -hmm and world, op uh, world openness, mm -hmm. which has a completely different kind of, let's say, backbone to uh, monuments as such. So I'm not sure if you want to link that mm -hmm. to this question or where you want, you know, just to, to I, understand. I, I'm just interested if it is linked in your, in your view. Um, because from afar, I suppose, knowing people who are kind of circulating around these kind of these historians debates as, as it were yeah. um, and reading the kinds of reflections from people like Dirk Moses or Michael Rothberg on um because the, the the interesting thing it seems to me is that the, a lot of the kind of his, historical debate about the kinds of entangled histories that are being questioned very publicly come from German historians like Jürgen Simmerer for example or um I can't I forget the name but the, the sort of progenitors of entangled histories. It mm -hmm. seems like it, it comes from there. The Shaligi Randeria as well, who's mm -hmm. in the whole one who raises that. So it was really a question about whether whether that plays into some of the discussions mm -hmm. you were. You yeah, were. I mean, by the time it was called into kind of a uh, new historical strike. Yeah. Yes. So in that yeah. sense, uh, yeah, it interplays in it. I'm not sure if it really interplays into question memorials mm -hmm. as such. Yeah. 
more the discourses they create and maybe the what Basil greatly said so it's the ideology around it and where it leaves out things and what is allowed and what is not allowed so to speak um there I would say yes but I'm not not I don't really around I mean another example for example is now in Indiana uh, the, uh, the Luega Denkmal who was a kind of very openly anti-Semite and it's very proudly present still in the city and for many years, it's been debated. It's been there were interventions, everything, but it's still there. Yeah. So finally, now in a closed competition, which is unclear about the democratic procedures behind, uh, okay. they decided to bring up a proposal that's been made ten years ago, where you basically put Lurga three degrees to the right. Mm -hmm. So now the debate is: is this still an answer? Mm -hmm. Maybe 10 years ago, it would have been an answer, but today, maybe with the complexities and it's also maybe the question of multi-directional memories, it's maybe not an answer anymore. So, yeah, I don't know if this answers your question, but... Uh, Thank you. Russell, yeah. do you want to pick up the, the Polish-Ukrainian? Right, yeah. right. Uh, just shortly, because I also see another question uh, in yeah, the yeah. chat here online. Yeah, so with regards to Ukrainian relations, uh, yeah, really shortly. Uh, first of all, I think, uh, yeah, this is another kind of uh, East European paradox where you have uh, basically uh, empires uh, which uh, have been colonized by themselves, right? I mean, uh, uh, themselves. Uh, so, I mean, of course, I think it was, uh, yeah, Polish, Rzeczpospolita, uh, right? It used to be. Uh, uh, empire and uh, colonizing Ukrainian uh, lands for uh, for a pretty long time, but then we have uh, this experience of the of the separation and the split of this empire and forceful colonization of this former empire by the Russian Empire. I think it also contributed to this uh, self awareness and a new type of attitude towards the former colonies, uh, Ukraine included. And secondly, I think what, uh, yeah, because now, of course, these relations are on, on their high, perhaps. Uh, I think that uh, what was also important uh, was basically uh, uh, such people in the cultural field as, uh, for instance, Yezha Gedroids and many others, but also Solidarity, Solidarność movement, right? Um, which uh, which uh, actually, I think it also requires some type of uh, very critical and profound self-reflection when the when the uh, um, when the view that uh, what you you were considering as your colony you start uh, um, treat as a separate territory as a separate state as a separate country uh, that was also what happened with the Polish common sense right when when it was stated clearly that uh, Vilnius and Lviv uh, is not are not Polish anymore and should not be Polish. That also started uh, the very healthy process in which uh, Poland, uh, yeah, decided to come to to terms with its own uh, colonial past. Uh, so and just really shortly, with uh, just not to uh, to um, omit any uh, positions here. Uh, so there is a question uh, fr uh, from the online chat that I I read from Anushka Alexander Rose. Uh, I've just been reading Sebald's on the natural history of destruction and wonder if we can pose this approach to Russia itself. What do you think their national commemoration and accountability will look like in the hope of a post-war surrender, especially when the lines between victim and perpetrator are blurred in their proximity? Uh, so uh, I think, uh, thank you for, for this question too. I think the, a key word here is uh, really the word hope. Uh, to be honest, I don't have any uh, hopes in that uh, regard. So basically, I think like when when we speak about any kind of post-war Russia, we are simply fantasizing at the moment because we cannot even imagine and understand the extent to which this war is being thought by not only by the Kremlin, by but by Russia itself as a forever war as an endless perpetual war and uh, uh, in order to to uh, bring somebody to accountability it un very unfortunately in germany basically is just another very good case an example for that 
one has to do that by force because there is no other mean uh, to uh, that the, uh, a perpetrator would be uh, held uh, accountable. And uh, unfortunately, I don't see any force uh, today in our global world which would be willing or able or ready to do that with regards to uh, the Russian so-called uh, Federation. So uh, I think uh, we are, uh, yeah, I think Europe's problems uh, haven't even started yet. I think on that um, grim but sober note, um, I would like to draw a line under our public conversation today. And once again, do that by thanking the panelists, Basil, Sophie, and Tanya, very much for your time, your insights, and your thoughts. We really appreciate it. Thank you for coming, and thanks for your opportunity. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> My pleasure. I hope to meet you in person sometime soon. Yeah, Ryan. Yeah, yeah thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Sophie. Yeah, we'll see you. Thank you. Yeah, ciao, ciao, ciao. Have a good day. Ciao. Thank you and thank you to the audience.